Hey everybody, welcome into another edition of the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust, proud legacy partner of the Chicago Cubs, an exclusive home of Cubs Chuck. Open online today at wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. I'm Tony Andraki, joined by Lance Brozdowski, and we had a special guest on this episode of the podcast, Jared Banner, the Vice President of Player Development for the Cubs. We talk about all things Cubs farm system, including Pete Crow Armstrong, Brennan Davis, and others, but Lance, you know, I know you're going to be down in Arizona very soon, and you're going to be getting a, a firsthand look at this prospect camp and, and seeing with your own eyes some of the things that Jared has seen recently. So what are you looking to do and accomplish interview-wise, but also just what are you looking to, to see when you're down there at the Cubs Complex? Yeah, I'm really excited to head down there. I'm excited to go to warmth, number one, very important. And number two, <laughs> also just season baseball. I feel like we've been, lockout's been a weird situation, you know, but I, I'm really excited to see what the Cubs have done, especially during the offseason, during these winter months with a lot of the guys who've stayed down there, like the Ed Howards of the world and such. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. We got, I think, James Triano's on the list, Pico Armstrong, Drew Gray is the third rounder from the 2021 draft, who I think is kind of a guy who's going to pop in the next couple of years. Talk, we're going to potentially do like a live bullpen with Max Bain, which will be really cool. He's an undrafted guy who is kind of popped, throws really hard, really into a lot of the tech behind making himself better and stuff. Um, and aside from that, you know, hopefully you do some cool demos, hopefully do something with our man, Rick Sutcliffe, talk maybe some intended zone stuff, talking about command, which would be really fun. Um, so we got a mix of stuff on the player specific side, but generally in terms of what I want to look for is just uh, development. Um, Scotty and I saw a ton of these guys in Myrtle Beach, South Bend, Iowa, et cetera, all these places. And I love seeing, I love going away from the game for four to five months and then coming back and seeing how these guys have physically changed. And especially if we get to see some live ABs between um, obviously Cubs pitching prospects and hitting prospects, maybe see if there's any mechanical changes or just anything that pops out as looking different, I think always makes for a really good story. And that's something I'm, I'm going to keep my eye on. Yeah. So Lance and uh, Scott Shagnon and producer Andrew Miller will be down in Arizona providing coverage of uh, the Cubs prospect camp and, and, you know, a lot of the guys in the minor league system. So make sure you stay tuned, sorry, stay tuned to marqueesportsnetwork.com and all the social channels, uh, including Lance's Twitter. Lance, you want to shout that out real quick? Yeah, Lance B-R-O-Z, Lance Braz. And then uh, at Watch Marquee as well on social channels. So as for right now, we'll get to our conversation with Jared and talk all things Cubs Farm System. All right, we're joined by a special guest here on the Cubs Weekly Podcast, Jared Banner, the Cubs Vice President of Player Development. Jared, first off, thanks so much for taking the time and joining us here. Of course, happy to be here with you guys. So last year was your first full year with the Cubs here after a couple of years with the Mets and uh, obviously in a new role this year. Just curious, how has the first year plus gone with the Cubs organization and what are you hoping to accomplish here in 2022? Well, first and foremost, is a first class organization. Um, you know, we do a lot of things really well here been treated really well by, you know, all the front office and, and fans and uh, players and, and the like. So um, it's just great to be a part of such a historic um, winning franchise like like this one. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks again for, for joining us. Uh, we're really excited to chat with you and dig into some topics. I think uh, staying a little bit high level and just talking about the differences of organizations you've been in, what do you think makes a organization's player development good? Yeah, well, I, I think it, it starts with um, with the obvious, right? And that's good players. <laughs> I think uh, that that's the key. And we luckily we have a lot of good ones around here. I think uh, Louis Elhawa and Dan Kankshevitz and, and Matt Dory in the past have done a great job identifying talent throughout the country and throughout the world to uh, to bring to this organization. And obviously, uh, with some of the trades last summer, uh, we were able to uh, go bring in some guys from other organizations and, and add them to our system as well. So. Um, I'm, I'm first and foremost excited about the, the talent we have. Um, and in addition to that, we, we have a great staff here, both, um, you know, office staff as well as on field staff, people that are, um, you know, people with growth mindsets, looking to learn, looking to grow, looking to get better every day. And I think that that rubs off on our players. Jared, uh, you're down in Arizona right now, and I know you guys are working on this prospect camp with a lot of the minor leaguers and stuff down there. Just curious, you know, how that kind of came about and how it has gone so far for the first couple of weeks here. Yeah, it's great to just, you know, bring some of the, the younger players in, give them a little head start on, on spring. Also, some of the pitchers, just give them a little bit of a slower ramp up um, into, into their, their pitching buildup. Um, so it's been, it's been great. 
just good to see the guys out on the field again. Um, you know, the last couple of years have um, had some some trials and tribulations to spring training, right? It hasn't been normal in, in 20 or 21. So uh, it's just nice to have everyone out here again on the field under the sun, um, just getting better every day. What's well, one of the biggest difficulties uh, in, involved with incorporating new talent into an organization when you guys already have, uh, you know, system in place and principles in place and guys might be coming from various organizations um, to kind of create a cohesive element and a cohesive theme among those guys. What's, what's the biggest difficulty in incorporating guys seamlessly? Well, just, just with the talent level of some of the players we acquired, I, I wouldn't, uh, you know, highlight any challenges, right? When you're bringing in players of this caliber, um, it's only really a positive thing. Uh, with that being said, obviously, we don't have as much hands-on history. So we like to, to spend a ton of time with them, get assessments physically, uh, high performance, medical, um, mental skills, all those different areas, um, just to develop that relationship, make sure the player's comfortable. Um, and and I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, when those guys take, take the field that um, they feel like this is, this is their home and, and we provide all the resources they need for them. Jared, you mentioned that just 2020 and 21 were far from normal, uh, you know, especially for minor leaguers, like when you're talking about alternate site and and just a, an atypical year in so many ways. So how do you guys make sure in player development, make sure that, you know, development is as linear as possible? Or, you know, how do you make sure that there is the last couple of years has not hindered development in any way and, and no stagnation and trying to get guys to advance as much as possible? Well, I, I think you hit it on the head about development. Um, it, but it's not linear, right? Even, even in the best of scenarios, there are, there are ups and downs and, and adversity. Um, and, you know, some of the setbacks that, that we've all faced uh, as a world these past couple of years, um, you know, there are challenges on, on the field as well. And um, I think our focus is to just educate our guys and um, keep working with them the, the same way we normally would. And, um, you know, just find ways to get better each day and, I, I really do feel like with all the resources we have, the technology we have, um, and the personnel we have, that, that we'll be successful. I know you guys as an organization have kind of talked a little bit about in the past, at least publicly, about having like three pillars in terms of pitching development um, regarding velocity, pitch shape command, or pitch shape movement, and then command separately. Um, and I know in speaking with some others in your organization, one of the things you guys pushed towards was velocity, and you guys saw a pretty big stuff gain quote unquote stuff, you know, the quality of a guy's pitches. Um, but one of the difficulties you ran into was kind of balancing that with the inherent risk that comes with throwing harder, which is based primarily on injuries. Um, and those kind of popped up in a lot of the prospects you guys have on the pitching side, Michael McAveen, Cole Franklin, et cetera, et cetera. I'm curious what you guys learned from uh, dealing with a couple road roadblocks, maybe speed bumps, so to speak, about implementing a process that, uh, you know, maybe changes historically how a, a team has functioned in the past. Yeah, I think first and foremost, our like Brez, Craig Breslow, and uh, Casey Jacobson, and, and James Ogden, our pitching coordinators. Um, I think they do a great job just um, blogging and assessing, and, and we use our pitching lab in, in great depth to you know game baselines or improve pitch types and, and things of that nature. And injuries are a part of the process with with pitching. Um, when you have great stuff, you know it, it obviously. Um, can, can create a strain on the arm. Um, and we're constantly trying to learn and, and evolve and um, be on the same page so that we know that if something is going wrong or something does need to change, we can all change together, right? We're always logging our information. We're always assessing ourselves um, and we will continue to do so. But, um, you know, the hope is that, that we will be able to stay a little bit healthier this year. But, you know, some of that is, uh, you know, is a little bit of luck. And, and the reality is that um, I don't know if anyone has quite figured out yet how to keep pitchers healthy. <laughs> it's a, it's an ongoing, it, it's an ongoing research project. That's the best way to put it. <laughs> Jared, there's a lot of players in the system that are pretty young and particularly acquired over the last year or so from international, uh, 
signing period or the draft or just trade various trades. But, you know, they're several years away from Chicago. But what are the key with those guys who some may not have even necessarily played but a bunch at stateside or even played much uh, in the pros? What are the keys to developing guys like that and getting them to where you want to go, you know, in a one year uh, just kind of snapshot or in a three or five year kind of big picture? I think the focus for us is, is evidence-based development, right? Everything we do uh, is based on evidence and, and research we've done and, you know, trying to make uh, practice harder so that the game's easier, right? That's one of, that's one of our focuses. So, um, you know, from the, from the lowest levels all the way to the top, um, you know, we're trying to push these guys uh, and make it difficult on them. And, and we believe that, you know, at the ends of, of your ability, that's where you learn the most. Um, and we're trying to really push that this year. And uh, I, I think it'll provide, uh, it'll be very fruitful for us. Yeah, that, that evidence-based approach is something I, I've heard you say elsewhere in some other interviews you've done. And uh, I think it, it seems to be a commonality among some of the better player development organizations in baseball. I'm curious, taking a step back and thinking of it from, almost from our angle on the media side, um, so much of baseball is evidence-based. I'm curious as to whether you think that the public has a general misconception around a piece of evidence, whether it be something like pitch velocity or exit velocity, you know, is there something that, you know, the public you think gets a little bit wrong in terms of how you guys use potentially the information to develop players? I'm not sure. What, what does the public think? <laughs> what do you think the public thinks? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not sure. I try to stay off social media smart, and smart. all that stuff as much as I can. So um, I, I'm not sure what, like, when yeah. you say that, like, are there, are there things that you personally, sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> are there, the job does not stop, by the way, just because we're, we're on. Um, are, are there things that you think are uh, are misconceptions? Yeah, I mean, I, I think for the most part, I align myself a lot of what major organizations believe. But I do think specifically in some of the exit velocity stats on the hitting side and also pitch velocity, um, I think for the most part, the data people and people who maybe understand the game in an advanced sense know how big a, a piece of the, the pie that is towards a player's success. Whereas I think on the public side, there's often a, a tendency to go towards small things and some of the maybe tail examples, the outlier examples and go, you know, you know, most, most guys powers to the pull side, but Hey, hitting the other way, got to hit the ball the other way, got to hit the ball the other way or on the velocity side, you know, velocity is super important, but you know, if you could just command the ball, that's great. And I think that there's often like a disconnect there where, where we on the public side really want to, or the people on the data side really want to push like, you know, velocity and exit velocity really matter. They're, they're massive contributors to a player's success. Whereas there's a lot of anecdotal evidence thrown around about like, no, hitting the bit all ball the other way matters or command matters more. So I'm curious if there's yeah. kind of a way you guys internalize that data that maybe can help some people on the public side. Yeah, I, I think our R&D department does a great job doing research and, and making it very clear to us um, which measures are predictive mm -hmm. and, and which measures are not, right? And, and um, you know, measurements like exit velo and, and pitch velocity are both, um, you know, very predictive of, of success generally. Now, are there outliers? Yes, of course. But, um, you know, and I won't give away all the stats and measurements that, that we that we look at. But um, I, I do think that sometimes the, the public might be um, or might be used to talking about some different some different terms and, and ideas and philosophies. Um, but our goal is to continue to grow and evolve. And, and maybe what we look at as being important now, maybe the data will tell us something different six months from now or a year from now. So, you know, we need to always continuously evolve um, as well. So I don't want to say any, any one side is right or wrong. I think we're just going to go with what the, um, the evidence is and, and be adjustable if that changes. Lance, were you, when you were asking that question, did you have a baseball in your hand? Yeah, I do. Actually. Yeah, <laughs> it helps. For, for those... know, helps. Locked and loaded. He's ready. <laughs> were, you, go, were you a pitcher, Lance? Way back in the day. I, I'm, I'm <laughs> I, can, I can tell. I can. I should be like interviewing you. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you have pitcher's hair too. You have some real flow going there. I used yeah. to have it longer. I'll, I'll send you pics after this. <laughs> <laughs> no, no pics necessary, Lance. Uh, but thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> uh, Jared, for you, when you were talking about the wanting to push guys to their limits and being aggressive. How do you balance the be, wanting to be aggressive with what we were talking about earlier with, you know, trying to keep guys healthy and make sure that there's this delicate balance there between being aggressive, but keeping guys healthy? 
yeah, obviously it's a, it is a delicate balance that we always pay a lot of attention to. Our high performance department uh, does a really good job measuring workload um, and and making sure we're not overdoing it with, with our guys. But but also the real focus is, um, you know, with difficult practice, you might not have to do as much of it compared to like your typical practice, right? So let's say. Um, you know, we're dealing with ground balls, right? And something you'll probably see is we're, we're taking a lot of ground balls off the machine. Um, and maybe you just do four or five of those, right? At high speed compared to, you know, 25 or 30 at typical fungo speed. You know what I mean? So you can, you can save some, some energy physically while also like really pushing yourself for those five reps, right? So it's a give and take. It's it's a balance, and it's obviously something we pay a lot of attention to. Can you give us another example or two about that idea around making practice more difficult, um, related maybe to one to the hitting side and one to the pitching side? Just something you guys do generally to change, you know, what maybe has always been done. Uh, it doesn't have to be obviously. I, I know there's some stuff here probably that's proprietary, but I imagine there's some examples you might be able to give that are a little more simple. Yeah. Well, um, I'll, I'll put it this: we we have we use a lot of of pitching machines to. Um, throw BP at, at high velocity to our hitters. Mm -hmm. And we actually have some special machines that, you know, we can set spin rates and shapes and spin efficiencies and things like that to really mirror, um, you know, big league outings, th things of that nature. So, um, you know, we can make it really challenging on, on those hitters when, when we want to. And just, I know you asked about pitching as well. Um, mm -hmm. Just, you know, one example is, um, you know, when guys typically throw live, BP bullpens, right? For for example, but not not in the pen when they go out onto the field and they're facing a hitter. Um, you know, maybe that means throwing a base runner out there. Maybe that means creating a, an environment that's that's a little bit more game like, right? Just th those are just some ideas. It's really a way of thinking. Um, that doesn't mean we're going to do it every time, but um, it's it's just kind of the way we we view development. I know Cubs fans are pretty excited about quite a few guys in the system, but you know probably the guy they're most excited about is Brennan Davis. And uh, with him in particular, Jared, I'm curious what realistic expectations are for Brennan in 2022 here. Yeah, Brennan's a, uh, an impressive young player, had a really big year last year. And the thing that probably impressed me the most was how, how well he adjusted to AAA when he got there um, and, and really swung the bat well. And he's been working out hard here all this off season and um putting in all the time and, and he looks great um, in terms of timelines and expectations. You know, it, it's hard to say right now, we need to get through spring training and then kind of see where we are as, um, as a group. Um, with that being said, obviously he's, he's performed a bit at the AAA level already. And um, I, I think it's safe to say he's not too far off from the big leagues. It's just a matter of, uh, of time and, and, you know, just topping off that development a little bit. Was there another player uh, you, you mentioned per, you praising Brennan Davis? I think anyone who's seen him live or spoken with him is both impressed on the character side as well as the performance side with him. Is there another player in the organization that maybe you don't think is talked about as much that has really stood out to you, whether it be a pitcher or a hitter? Yeah, a, a lot of them actually, but um, I can't choose between them. It's like, I don't know if you guys have kids, but <laughs> like, which parent do you like more? I, I don't know. I can't answer that question, but who, who are some guys that you want to talk about? I'm curious on a lot of the guys. Again, we, we were talking a little bit about injuries, the McAveens of the world, um, Cole Franklin, Riley Thompson, some of those guys who maybe have been injured. Uh, has any of them, you know, progressed past the injury to the point where you don't think they've maybe lost as much development as, you know, maybe you guys were worried about initially when you see a guy go down and he won't throw for four or five I'll, months, you know? I'll, I'll say this. Um, those guys are healthy now and they look great. I'm really, I'm really excited about, about those guys. I know a couple of guys that I'm curious about were, you know, guys from the draft hall a summer ago. So Jordan Wicks, he was really impress impressive when we got a chance to speak to him via Zoom, you know, right after the draft. And then James Triantos as well, I know is a guy that um, has gotten some headlines, you know, especially recently here. So Jared, with those two in specific, you know, what, um, what are you looking for from them? What have you seen from them so far in the short time they've been a part of the Cubs organization? Yeah, Triantos is a uh, really impressive young hitter, got a great right-handed swing, ton of power, um, left side of the infield defender. Um, and just, he's a, he's a workaholic. He's always trying to make himself better. He's in the, 
in the cage every day, out on the field every day, pushing himself. Um, I'm really excited about him. I think he's going to uh, have a really great season. And uh, Wicks, obviously mature college lefty, great, great college performance. Um, he, he's a guy with, you know, just knows how to mix and match his stuff and pull the string, can spin the ball, um, good command. He, he's just a very well-rounded pitcher that, that really has a, a great idea for what he's doing out there for his craft. Um, so we're, we're really excited about, about both those guys. And, um, you know, we expect both of them to be a part of our future. I think one thing I've heard um, in regards to other organizations is often some of the ones that, you know, there might be a misconception, like a team, team maybe doesn't produce a ton of players from the minor league system that are successful. And you, there's a variety of reasons you could come up as to why, but one of them that I find most interesting is a disconnect between who the organization requires from the talent acquisition side, and then what the organization develops well. Um, and obviously you guys, I think in the most recent years, at least have started to sync this up really well to the point where um, there's a, I mean, obviously you can see just the jump year over year and the amount of valuable prospects that the organization has. Um, but I, I guess I'm curious on that point of like, how do you sync up, how, how do you guys work on the integration between multiple departments, specifically in relation to talent acquisition and player development and making sure that, you know, the guys that are coming into the system are those that you know you can develop or you know that you can maybe pull one or two lovers on and, and make them exponentially better? Yeah, I think um, there's a lot of synergy within this organization, um, both between scouting, player development, R&D. Um, we all really, what I think, um, I, I think we all work really well together. Uh, from from my perspective, um, you know, Dan Kantrovitz, for example, um, you know, I was in the draft room. I was a part of that process. Got to kind of watch, um, you know, him be the conductor of the draft room. Um, and and I thought he did a great job with the amateur draft. And um, our 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 goal is to trust them and our process as an organization. And then it's our job to develop whatever shows up here at the complex, right? So I don't like to ever say, oh, well, you know, we're best at developing this type of player, that type of player. If we're operating on all cylinders the way we can, we should be able to develop any type of player, whether they're athletic or hard throwing or, you know, they're a speed guy or, you know, def defense first, wh whatever it may be, um, we should be able to make them better. And, and that's, that's our goal. And you mentioned in there the process being a huge part of the organization. I'm curious generally in how you, you know, think about fixing a disconnect in a part of the system. I imagine this is something you guys maybe had to do in the past or you maybe had to do at other organizations, but I guess I'm thinking more from like, you know, what the front office thinks down to the coordinators, down to the coaches, down to the players. I, I'm always fascinated by talking to individuals at various levels there and seeing sometimes that there may be philosophical differences and such. So I guess, you know, hypothetically, um, if there was a disconnect at some point in the system, how would you guys approach changing that? If there was, well, I guess <laughs> the first answer is hopefully we can avoid disconnects, right? Sure. I think mm -hmm. I think the key is for everyone to know which, which way we're pulling the rope. Uh, and that's, I, I think that's the first piece of this that's, that's really important, but we just communicate a lot. We, we spend a lot of time in the same room or on the same Zoom talking to each other about things and everyone knows the plan. Right. And everyone gets a chance to talk through drink, talk through things. And then we set a direction as an organization. So um, it might not always be the direction that we all agree with. And this is with any decision. But ultimately, as a group, we come to the decision as the Chicago Cubs and then we move forward with that. Mm -hmm. And one more thing I want to talk about, and, and I'll pass it back to Tony, is related to this idea around evidence-based decisions. I think that's something, again, that I've heard you say a couple of times and I, I love from a philosophical standpoint. Um, I'm curious about applying that evidence-based approach to coaches. I feel like we often see a lot of analytics around players, um, whether it be, you know, player development analytics or just service level analytics that are thrown on the, on the bug on TV, you know what I mean? But with coaches, I feel like there hasn't been a lot of discussion in the public space about how they're graded and analyzed in an objective way, potentially such that you guys can make, ensure that you're getting improvement in them. Um, and also just, you have good coaches. Um, I'm curious as to whether you have any thoughts or whether you guys do anything specifically around like a report card with coaches or how you internally analyze whether a coach yeah. is leading and how to make them better. Well, I think our development is, is mostly based around our player plans, right? We have plans for each player. Um, 
that address their physical, fundamental, mental skills um, across the board. And I think a coach's job is to coach to the player plan, right? Mm -hmm. The areas that we think the player needs to uh, work on the most or focus on the most, the key is for our coaches to kind of follow those guidelines. And a lot of cases, our coaches are the ones in conjunction with our R&D staff that put together those player plans. So um, the key is for everyone to know what the goals are and to chase after those goals um, with our development on a daily basis. And if, um, you know, if we do that, and I, I'm included in that, it's not just coaches, it's, it's part of my role too, to make sure we're chasing those goals every day. Um, if we all do what we're supposed to in, in that way, then it'll show itself on the field. Yeah, that's an interesting concept to evaluate coaches who help players along their player development journey. Cubs fans, make sure you stick around for more from Jared, but first, a quick word from our sponsor. At Wintrust, we know true fans show their team pride every chance they get. With Cubs checking, you'll score a Cubs debit card so you can show your support every time you pay. Open today at Wintrust.com slash Cubs Weekly. $100 required to open. Member FDIC. Getting back to some of the individual players um, they were curious about, you know, Pete Crow Armstrong is one that I know I'm particularly curious about. He was a guy, one of the headliners of the trade deadline last year, but due to injury, hasn't been on the field yet as a Cub, um, at least in game action. So, you know, I'm curious. I haven't had the opportunity to see him play, as I'm sure most Cubs fans haven't. What would I see, you know, out of Pete Crow Armstrong this year? What type of player is he in, and what has it been like to, you know, see him on the field in this year in particular? Yeah, so Pete's a, uh, a really great athlete. I don't know if he gets enough credit for how good of an athlete he is. Um, can really run as a premium defender in, in center field. I think that's going to jump out to you right away. Um, and offensively, he's just getting better and better and better. I know he obviously didn't play much last season due to injury, but he did work on his body and he did get stronger and, and mature um, as, a, as a ball player. And um, he's hitting the ball harder now than than ever. So um, I think he is going to uh, really open some eyes as soon as he's able to take the field again. And he's a full go right now. So we just, uh, I wish we could put him out there opening day tomorrow, but we have to get through spring training. So we'll wait. Sounds good. Um, and on the pitching front, you know, two guys that have put themselves on the map in recent year is Caleb Killian, another trade deadline acquisition, and DJ Hers, who really kind of had a breakout 2021. So Jared, can you just talk a little bit about those guys and what their development has been like and, you know, where, where they can go from here? Yeah, so obviously Killian was acquired um, midseason at the deadline there, and um, he really opened our eyes from, from the beginning. I think when you're evaluating from afar, um, you know, the picture is not always fully clear. And then um, I, I think when we actually, you know, got to see him pitch for us, um, and spent some time with him working on a few things and, and how watching how quickly he adapted and adjusted and um, and performed so well. I, I think we knew we were we were really on to something at, as an organization. So he, he looks great. He's a physical specimen. Wait, do you guys wait? Do you guys see him out there? Um, you know, he's throwing hard. Change up has looked really good. Um, breaking ball looks good. I, I know you guys probably saw him throwing the, in the fall league next championship game. Um, he is a. Uh, you know, the sky's the limit. So we're, we're excited about, uh, another player that I think, sorry, I, I, there was one other person oh, there, wasn't there? Oh yeah. <laughs> sorry. DJ hers. DJ. Yeah. DJ hers. Sorry. I, I, You're good. I, um, going back to Lance's question earlier about guys who might not get enough, enough credit. Um, DJ hers, I mean, he, I think he had a 40% strikeout rate last year, something thereabouts. Um, and he's left-handed and he's athletic and has, you know, pretty good stuff. And it's, I, I don't know if this guy gets enough publicity, honestly. He's, he's a really impressive young pitcher and we're, we're really excited about him. Yeah, I think really 40% fun. might lead all starters in the minor leagues last year. So he's definitely right at the top of the list, so. I, I think that's right. I think he had the highest strikeout rate of any minor league pitcher last year. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, he, was, he was really fun for us to talk to down in Myrtle Beach. Scotty yeah. and I went there, and he's just a really good kid, too. Um, and another guy I think that a lot of Cub fans and people who follow prospects are um, really interested in is Christian Hernandez, who, you know, I, I feel like most of the reports I've seen out there are probably very limited in terms of how many people actually saw him, whether they were in the Dominican 
Um, but this is, he's kind of came over, I think, late last year, state type for the first time. It didn't sound like he was hitting too much. It seemed like he was doing a lot of infield work. I don't think anyone laid eyes on him swinging. And now we head into this spring training. I, I hope, you know, we're going to see a lot more of him. I imagine he'll maybe start in the AFL or something, or AZL, excuse me. Um, I'm curious just what your guys' expectations are around him, because it seems like the public's expectations are incredibly high. Just from a developmental standpoint, our, ex our expectations are for him to uh, come to the ballpark every day and, and work and, and try to get a little bit better, right? I think that's the the focus for us. Um, ultimately, we obviously think he's really talented, and we know the tools that he has. And again, Louis O'Hara and how and his staff do a great job identifying players uh, internationally. So, what we do definitely think he's a a part of our future, but. In the short term, it's it's always hard to say. Like I like I mentioned earlier, development's not always linear, um, but I I feel confident that um that that he is a, a very good baseball player and someone that um that we'll be talking about for years to come. It, one guy too, uh, you know, high draft pick a couple of years ago, Ed Howard. He had so much success. Obviously, the end of his high school career was impacted by the pandemic, but. You know, to, to go to pro ball as well and, and experience a little bit of struggle and, and just kind of learn and, and grow from that. How valuable do you think that has been for Ed and could be moving forward? Right. Like, like we talked about earlier, it's not always linear. So anytime you face adversity, um, you know, it's about how you bounce back from it. And it's been here at the complex all off offseason, um, working with our, our strength guys, working with our coaching staff. Um, just every day to get better. And, and he has a great head on his shoulders. And as you guys know, he has all the tools in the world, right? He's a great defender, can run, can hit for a ton of power. Um, so there are just some, some adjustments that, that he's going to need to make at the plate. And he's very aware of that. And I think we all think he's going to go out there and make them and, and have a big year. Um, I'm jumping, you know, I guess Ed's probably a bit of a ways off more development for him, but I, I imagine there's other guys you have in the high levels of the, of the system on the relief pitching side. Um, it seems like every year, I feel like teams always have relief pitchers come up from the minor leagues or guys people haven't heard of that succeed and end up, you know, getting really important outs for a major league organization. I'm curious as to whether there's anyone in AAA that you are really excited about, um, whether that be like a Ben Leeper type or even a guy who's maybe a little bit further off, like a Brendan Little or, a, or even like a Burl Caraway. Um, who you think can have an impact in the back end of a bullpen for the major league team? Well, you know, I don't ever pick between guys, Lance. Try but, um, you. I tried, I tried, I failed. Um, <laughs> who, who, who would you like to address specifically? Yeah, let's let's go Leaper to Little because I feel like they're very different prospects. Leaper being one who's, a, you know, has had some injury history, but really good slide, really good fastball. I imagine he's a guy who we might see in Wrigley Field. And then Little being a guy who's much further off, but has the raw stuff that I think anybody looks for when trying to build a reliever. Yeah, Leeper is um, is a very unique story, just in the sense that he he really covered a lot of ground last year in terms of moving up levels. Um, but he was he was that good, right? He was missing that many bats. He was keeping his stuff in the zone, um, and he was really overpowering at times. And, and we couldn't we couldn't hold him back, right? Uh, the players often tell you when when they're ready to move up, and and he told us on multiple occasions last year with his performance. So. We're excited about him. He's he's here and he he's in camp and he's he's ready to go. In terms of Brendan, Brendan Little, Little, yeah, yeah. Um, he really came into his own last year. Uh, in in a lot of ways, he was he was healthy and um, you know he's pitching in relief and and really getting a lot of guys out and obviously made it up to AAA level and um, we're excited about his his future as well. We've obviously, always believed in him as an organization. Um, and when you're left-handed with his kind of stuff. Um, you know, the, uh, the sky's the limit for you. So we're excited about both those guys. Well, Jared, thank you so much. We really appreciate all the knowledge on the system and uh, really appreciate your time with us here on the Cubs Weekly Podcast. Anytime, guys. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right, that'll do it for this week's edition of the Cubs Weekly Podcast presented by Wintrust. Don't forget to download and subscribe to the pod on Spotify or Apple Podcasts and check us out in video form on the Marquee Sports Network app and YouTube. And stay tuned to MarqueeSportsNetwork.com and all of our social channels for prospect content all month. Thanks for listening.